Woo! So there will not be a Pod Therapy World Tour anytime soon. Tour. Tour. There might be. It'll just be me and Nick, though. Yeah. <laughs> I'll zoom in. Which was the plan all along. You will not. <laughs> <laughs> From fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada, this is Pod Therapy. Real people, real problems, and real therapists. You can submit your questions anonymously at podtherapy.net or email us at podtherapyguys at gmail.com. Jim has a new book out. 100 Reasons to Never Leave Home. Check it out now on Amazon. <laughs> and now broadcasting from the churn, that guy's Dr. Jim Jobin. I'm Nick Tangeman. It's time See for some the world therapy. from your couch. That sounds great. That's what YouTube is. I just put it on the TV, and then you can watch a little video about anywhere in the world. And it's great. You're getting the best pictures. I get I'm fine. Yeah. I'm fine with that. Also, I don't, don't understand go anywhere, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> going to, like, okay, it makes more sense now that we all have the cell phones and the cameras and all that stuff. But back in the day, whenever, when I went to Europe, and, and like, everybody had the throwaway cameras and stuff, and some people had the nice ones, <laughs> it never made sense to me that they were taking their own pictures of the Coliseum or, like, these, these beautiful places. Go to the gift shop and get the postcard. No. That's the best picture. The best no. picture has already been taken. No. And they're selling it in the shop. No. Just go get that. But it always seemed silly to me. It's like, well, you could also just look that up online. Like, no, why are no, you, no. what do you the, need this the for? The best pictures are the ones that you take that are, that have meaning to you. So when you look at it, you remember what it was like to be there. I'm better you off. You can't get that no. from a gift shop. You, If you're in the picture, fine. If you're taking a selfie or you're taking pictures of friends and family, Great. There there you are. There you are at that place. Awesome. But I don't I I do if you're taking a picture of the Vatican, that doesn't make any sense to me. Like just go into the gift shop and get the best picture of the Vatican. They sell it for five bucks. Or Euro, I believe is what they're or Lira, I believe, is what the, that's called. Impressed? Impressed that I know all that? I, I no, I don't know. Yeah, I know. I, know. I know about the money in, in Italy. The Italian money. Italy's Please. still on the Euro, on the Lira? <clears throat> I, I want to say yes. Yeah. Okay. Or is it Greece? It's Greece, isn't it? Is it? No, is Greece it has the euro. Greece is definitely on the euro. Oh well, hold on. I was and there. They were on like, the drachma before. Oh, drachma. That yeah. was it. Yeah. Now I went in like two thousand and I don't know two. You know, so I. Oh, they were already on the euro by then. Yeah. Whatever. I don't know any of this, but my point is, there's no reason to leave home. I was in Greece in the nineties when it was the drachma. Okay. And it was like six hundred to one. Oh wow. On the exchange rate, I mean. You could just go on the town and go nuts for like twenty bucks. Oh, yeah, it was yeah. great, and yeah. everything was uh, you'd, you'd haggle for everything. Uh huh. Yeah, you got to discuss it, right? Yeah. Which I, which I don't think is the case now. I haven't been I haven't been there since they were on the euro. Yeah, but I don't believe that's the case now. And the value the of the American is, dollar is steadier, yeah. right? Yeah, and uh, well, I don't think it's the value. I think it's just I mean the value of the of the euro is more set. And it's set by outside forces, right? Yeah. Not just the the Greek, the economy. local economy. Yeah, right. I think I was in Greece in 2013, 2014, something like that. Yeah, and yeah. There wasn't a whole lot of haggling for anything. When no, I, was I mean, there. it was like if you wanted a soda. Oh wow! You haggled yeah. for it. I mean, yeah. you haggled oh, for everything. So, do you yeah. see? You are you are explaining my point. Why don't I travel? It was that. wonderful. That sounds horrible. No, it was wonderful. <laughs> Let me spend 20 minutes talking to this dude in a language I don't understand so I can get a Coke. Oh, no. Everybody you don't in... have to do it, though. If you and, want your Coke. And also, everybody in Greece spoke English. Yeah. Whatever. And, like, and perfect English. Better than me? Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly. <laughs> they definitely said tour and not tour. <laughs> I am known for my linguistic <laughs> abilities. How dare you, sir? Whatever. I would have no reason to leave Las Vegas. Also, Las Vegas builds everything here, right? I don't need to go to Egypt. We have the Luxor. Bam. You're right. No Same reason to go to Paris. Thing. Don't need to go to England. We have Excalibur. Bam. Don't need to do that. We have castles here, fool. Don't need to go to Rome. We have Caesar's Palace. Don't need to go to New York. Again, I'm fine that. with everything he's saying. Yeah. Please, please write in. If you, if Italy, you, got the Bellagio. If you agree with Jim, got the I, I want to hear. <laughs> we have the Paris. <laughs> please write in. I don't need to go there. Podtherapyguys at gmail.com. Very simple. Very simple. I already live where everything is. Everything comes to me. I don't have to go anywhere. Fair. Don't have Great. to go to Hiltonville because we have the Hilton. It's all the same. So, let's do some therapy stuff. Okay. Advice for a new therapist. Hey, guys, I recently discovered your podcast from the Reddit AMA. Oh, Yay. wonderful. Welcome to the show. I graduated last year with my MSW, uh, for the listener, that means a Master's of Social Work, 
and am currently working toward my LCSW. That is a licensed clinical social worker, which is a licensed therapist. I would like to know what advice you have for new therapists entering the field. Additionally, what advice would you have for continued professional development? I feel there is still a lot I need to learn. Thanks, guys. I'm currently working my way through all the episodes. Keep it up. Oh, jeez. Right. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. First off, don't listen to any of those episodes. I'll make you a worse therapist. <laughs> First point about continuing education. Stop listening to the show. <laughs> You can do better. <laughs> I don't know. I would say we're not doing harm. No, 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 no. Probably not doing any good, but we're no. not doing harm. Yeah, yeah. Lawful neutral, I think, is um, where we live. So, yeah, good for you. And yeah. good for you for selecting social work. Oh, come on. No, uh, it's, it's... Garbage. No, no, no. It's, right. it's marketable. Oh, it is marketable. You have to agree. Yeah, it's no. It's the right degree. No, and to I've pursue. told people that. When they're yeah. like, which, which life should I get? Yeah. Like, Reluctantly, you should become yes. an LCSW. Yeah, because you can go anywhere. Yeah, that's right. It's, it um, exists. It's the gold standard. It is. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, and I, you're already in a good spot because you're asking the right questions. Yes. Um, you know, what... what should I be focusing on? I, I know I have a lot to learn. Yeah, you do, as anybody does yep. in, the, in any new field that you go into. Um, I would just, I, I would focus on a couple of things. Number one, I would focus on good self care management, um, figuring out some ways to, you know, as you get into this field, to be able to uh, both be empathetic when working with patients, but then also be able to have some some sort of a firewall right and be able to leave work at work and home at home um, developing uh, that that discipline uh, to separate those two is going to be very important good self-care yeah so I definitely start with that the other thing is you know just get involved in as many uh, trainings as you can um, and then find a couple things that you really want to specialize in yeah. and focus on those. But in your first couple of years, it's really nice to just try out a lot of different things. You know, yeah. go to, you know, an introductory training on, like we talked about last session, mindfulness meditation. Do another yeah. one on uh, maybe DBT or, or something else and, and figure out kind of where those things are that you're really interested in and then you can really kind of start specializing in that yeah and i think one thing for for the general audience they probably don't know about you you go to school right and you do all this learning about how to become a therapist you do all this uh hands-on training as a student you know you're like you're doing real therapy but honestly and i don't know if this is true for you nick but it's true for me i feel i learned my most reliable techniques and skills after school Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, like in, I mean, I feel like I, I had the bedrock, I had the yeah. fundamentals. I, but I think all the school stuff that I did really just prepared me to know and understand and receive and use the real techniques that I picked up at conferences and mm -hmm. seminars. I think that's where you get a lot of your best stuff. Yeah. So, in, as a new therapist, I think immediate advice really continue to look for that stuff. And it's tricky, right? Because a lot of people are trying to get to work in the field, and I think that's fine. Um, but, you know, as much as you can, looking for the big conferences, I think there's usually a whole lot of sessions there. Uh, the um, the American Psychological Association runs a big conference. Yep. Um, the uh, NADAC uh, runs a big conference. If you're interested mm -hmm. in substance abuse stuff, there's always an annual one there. So one piece of advice I would give a new therapist when it comes to conferences, seminars, things that you should study up on, I always tell new therapists, it'd be great if you if you took advanced training in three different areas. I want you to have a basket that you're learning uh, a standard technique like CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. I want you to attend a seminar, do a good workshop on really applying CBT. And I think that's a great basket of skills you're going to use everywhere. Mm -hmm. I want every new therapist to go to a seminar and learn at least one really good couple skill. Because, you know, like it, you get some systems theory training, you do get some couples uh, therapy training, but I think if you can go to like a Gottman Institute seminar, don't sign up for the scam. Don't, don't do the stupid levels thing or like, you know, try oh, to get don't like... don't do the scam. Don't do the scam. Okay. Yeah, don't do that. Don't get like the Changes levels. my whole uh, strategy. Yeah. That's why he's the best. That's, All that's right. it. <laughs> you go to a lot of these stupid things and they're like, we'll teach you Gottman level one and then you can get Gottman level two and then you can get... And it's just stupid to me. Like, I think at some point... You either know the theory okay, or you don't. Okay, hold on. You also think travel is a waste of time. It is a waste of time. Okay, okay I'm right. Just want to throw that in. Yeah, no, I'm right about that, and I'm right about this. But the stupid, like, you get, like, a new belt color and everything. It's just, it's a way to keep money coming in. So, but, like, do a Gottman training for couples work or go do EFT, uh, motion-focused oh, yeah, therapy, EFT as a couples seminar. 
do something in each in each uh, basket, right? So a really good individual skill like CBT or solution focused training. Do a really good couple seminar and really learn that. I'm really interested in what your third one is. Trauma. I, I really yes, think you should do a big say. trauma one. Yep. Yeah. And I like the IATP. I think it's the International Association of Trauma Professionals. They usually do um, big seminars across the country. I attended one of those. One of the smartest things I've ever done. It, mm-hmm. it gave me so much that uh, ended up becoming really helpful techniques for trauma work. Yeah. EMDR is very specific. I think if you're going for EMDR, it's very expensive. Um, and so, like, you're, you're training in a very specific technique. That's fine if that's your cup. Um, but I'd like you as a new therapist to do a, a big conference, a big seminar in those three areas. Something coupley, something uh, trauma-focused, and then something very practical like CBT. That is a must. And maybe addictions. And, and, and actually, yeah, trauma is a must. You have yeah. to do it. As a matter of fact, I think a lot of states, at least in Nevada, and I think a lot of states are doing the same thing, yeah. it's now a required CEU uh-huh. for continued licensure. So mm. every year we have to do three hours of trauma. Which I don't. I think it's fine. I think we should. You should mm-hmm. stay sharp. But what I'm advising is not just a CEU. Oh, no, like, no. No, I get a big yeah. one. Like, like get in there special and, as a, yeah, yeah, do just, a big workshop, like a multi-day yeah. workshop on those three areas. And honestly, addictions too. I mean, that's yeah. that's a beef I've had with a lot of other therapists. It, it's, it frightens me how many therapists had no training at all yeah. in addictions theory, knowing anything about substance abuse. And, and I certainly didn't. You know, in my master's program, it was a minimal thing. I, I think Nevada had a requirement that I take a class in it. It was not offered as part of my degree. Yeah. I took it just because I knew I wanted to practice in Nevada. I learned everything about addictions work on the road, in the field, you know, being working for companies and like under under tutelage a lot from you. And so like, you know, that's how you pick things up. But I think every therapist should have to do like some good advanced training in addictions work too. Yeah. And I, I actually started out in addictions. So that was kind of right out of graduate school. That's what I was doing. And yeah. I've been doing it since. But, and I was really surprised too, to learn how little most therapists who focus on mental health, how yeah. little they actually knew about addiction. Oh yeah. I thought, I kind of had the expectation that, like, you're specialized in mental health, but you've got a pretty solid understanding of addiction. And that right. typically is not the case. It's too often very siloed. And I think a lot of therapists that focus in mental health are sometimes a little intimidated yeah. with yeah. addiction. Yeah, they're scared of it. Yeah. yeah. And that's that's one of the things whenever you and I have run rehabs and stuff. You'd put a job out there and you'd say you're hiring for a therapist. And, you know, sometimes you'd get like an MFT, an LCSW or a CPC or whatever. And they'll come walking in and being like, yeah, you know, I'm a good therapist, blah, blah, blah. And first thing we ask them, what's your addictions background? You know, tell yeah. me about you. Know, I'm not seeing that. Oh, I've been, you know, I've worked at these clinics and they're mostly like mental health places. And we're like, yeah. I've taken a lot of drugs. Yeah. I've done all <laughs> the drugs. Yeah. <laughs> what what experience do you have? All uh, good ones. Lots. <laughs> I'm high right now. <laughs> He's ready. <laughs> Other than the spiders under my skin, all positive. Yeah, these bees in my teeth are making this interview really hard to concentrate. This guy knows what he's talking about. He's ready. But yeah, yeah, addictions is something. Uh, very few therapists. Um, the net. What is NAT, NADAC, Nick? It's like NAT. well, it, it used to be an acronym. It used to stand okay. for it's, now it's just the NADAC. National Association of Drug and Alcohol Counselors. Okay, but now it, it just goes by NADAC. Okay, yeah. Great place to pick up uh, some more training, too. Yeah. yeah. But that's how you figure it out. You know, learn from people in the field. Uh, put down the books. Uh, don't go buying books on the subjects anymore. In my opinion, at this stage of your career, in that early stage, I want you to get out. I want mm-hmm. you to go to conferences, meet people in the field, hear from people that have been doing this for a while, who are really good at a particular thing, hear how they do that. And, and that's awesome. And then yeah. just put that in your toolkit and then you take it on the road. Then you well, just take it into the, the and, sessions. And wherever you start, whatever organization or agency you start with, there's going to be some seasoned clinicians there. Yes. You know, pick their brain. Oh, observe yeah. Observe some sessions if you can. Just really kind of try to take in as much as you possibly the can. The best clinics, I think, do a rotation yearly where each therapist does a, a, a training during a staff meeting about a, a particular theory that they use. Mm-hmm. It's something they're really good at. And I love that because then we're just sharing the wealth, right? Because mm-hmm. everybody's eclectic. Everybody has their own approach. But it's really nice, you yeah. know, whenever you have somebody doing that. So that's what I'd recommend. If you can get into solution-focused brief therapy, I think for new yeah. therapists, that is a really great basket of techniques to just 
like weave into everything you're doing. It's just yep. a great launching pad. It has motivational interviewing wrapped inside of it. It's so effective, and it really just opens up the door to everything else. So yep. I would love that too. Yeah, I'd but agree. welcome to the profession. That's awesome. Congratulations, and uh, hope you're doing good work. And remember, um, anything that you've ever heard on our show is uh, misinformation. You should not uh, <laughs> don't don't use any of that. <laughs> take it with a grain of salt. Take it, oh, big old grain of salt. <laughs> take it with a mine of salt. <laughs> but you should try all the drugs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's how you become great. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, good question. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're talking about All chronic insomnia. <laughs> You're listening to Pod Therapy. Today's episode is brought to you by Smitty Scoop, Jake Schneider, Carolyn Albert, and Kevin Chamberlain. Would you like to sponsor the show? Become a therapy producer at patreon.com slash therapy. This week's trivia theme in honor of our therapy producers is continuing on with Trivial Pursuit 20th Anniversary Edition. Woo! Again, all multiple choice for our, uh, our participants. I'm going to nail it. Okay. I feel lucky. What nation was home to six of the world's top ten best-selling newspapers by 1998? Wow. A, France. B, Japan. C, United States. D, Germany. If you'd like to become a therapy producer and make the show possible, go to patreon.com slash therapy and sign up. Again, that's patreon.com slash it's, therapy. It's Re- like, repeat that? Obviously. What was, the, what was the first sentence? What nation was home to six of the top ten best-selling newspapers it's gotta by be. 1998? So, world, yes. best-selling around In the, the world? world. I assume. Okay. It's, it's obviously so, United States. France. There's no question. Japan. The United States or Germany? It's easily the United States. Think about it. New York Times, L.A. Times, USA Today. Those have got to be three of the biggest. Uh, is, you, uh, is U.S. your answer? Yes. Okay, great. Now I'm going to think <laughs> of the question. <laughs> <laughs> now that we've eliminated the wrong answer. Right. Or one of the three wrong answers. It's obviously that. Uh, it might be. It uh, might be. Slam dunk. I think it's not Japan. Okay. Because I don't think a whole lot of people outside of Japan, even in Asia, speak or, or read Japanese. Okay. Oh, okay. 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 That, yeah. That may be too specific of a language. Yeah. Okay. I think German would probably go by that same argument. But a lot Ger- of German speak English. That's that was that's my thought on Germany is that they, they could very easily just publish newspapers in English or, oh, or really? other more oh, common I don't languages. Think they can. I don't think so. You don't think the German people could do that? No. No, no. Yeah. It does seem a little out of their grasp. Yeah, yeah. No. I, Germans I'm, not known uh, for come on. you know. U.S. feels like the obvious answer, which is why I don't want to go U.S. because <laughs> okay. it's the red herring. I'm going France. You okay. know, I could see the argument for France by the language argument because yeah. French is one a lot of, of the most people popular. Speak, a lot of people, a lot of people speak a lot French. Of people do speak French. Uh, the the French also take the freedom of the press very seriously. They do, and they're very snooty. And so, being seen holding a newspaper. I think that would work for a lot of them. I don't think they read it. I think they hold it. I think they right. pose with it. I would. From I the would guy bet... who hates travel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Trust me. I know the French. Okay. <laughs> I know. Have I, would... I been there? No. I would bet, uh... for instance, that more newspapers that the, whose uh, publishers are in France are sold in Canada than uh, newspapers published in the U.S. Well, there's a lot of – yeah, I mean, there's a lot of French colonies through yeah. Africa. The, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sticking with France. I've talked myself into it even more now. All right, I know. I I'm kind of leaning towards France too. You know the answer. It is. It is Japan. Oh, <laughs> my first <laughs> so one out. Wrong. Yes. Dang, Japan. Really? Wow. Yes. Wow. I mean the Asian the Asian market made me want Japan first. Wow. But then yeah. my my Japanese argument talked myself. Well, out then of. and I was kind of course, wondering too. Everyone should keep in mind that I don't know anything. That helps. Right. Yeah, it does help. I thought it'd be USA for sure. No, wow. we caught that. Yep. Wow. Way to go, Japan. Way to be newsy. <laughs> Chronic insomnia. Wait, wait, do you have the order? Oh, uh, yeah. No, the... I don't. Okay. No. Wow. No. Way to be prepared. Dearest life coach. It was on the back of a Trivial Pursuit card. Oh, that's true. There you yeah. go. No, that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> and the lights. You have just been light coach. <laughs> <laughs> I love, love it. it because he got. They're not referenced. kidding. The lights really do happen. The, yeah. yeah, there really <laughs> we is. We need to actually put that on. Uh, yeah, if we ever live Instagram. stream this, no, just, I think people we need are, to put it on Instagram. Oh, the, the flashing lights. Yeah. That'd be a great I don't, reel. I yeah. think people think we're joking. No, we're not joking. <laughs> the lights happen. The lights happen every time. The pyros. He 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 
descends down a zip line into the studio. See, this is why people don't believe us. Well, some of this is true. Some <laughs> of this is left to interpretation. Dearest life coach, Spawn of Bat, and Iowa's favorite son. <laughs> I'm not sure which one of those I am. I have dealt uh, with... It's pretty clear. <laughs> it's pretty clear. I have dealt with insomnia since I was a teenager. I'm now 26. I've been health conscious for about that same length of time. Clean eating, vigorous exercise, all the good little check boxes. You know that type. Think Nick, but with less of an inclination to date Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> this writer is doing okay. everything. Not, not right. no inclination, but right. less. <laughs> yeah. All of the right. inside jokes in this one letter. <laughs> this is fantastic. Okay, I like to be in good physical nothing shape. nothing funny about Laura being a Nazi. Nothing funny. <laughs> the Germans do not have enough news. I like to be oh. in good physical shape, but at least as importantly, I like to feel like I'm nourishing my brain. This is not only because I find joy in learning and creating, but because I've dealt with depression and feel better when I take care of my body. But there's this insomnia issue. I'm well aware of how critical sleep is for one's mental and physical health, and I am all for making it a priority, to the extent that in high school I once advocated for my drama club to meet an hour earlier in the event or in the evening because I was concerned about our sleeping patterns. Do you know what that does to one's high school reputation? <laughs> <laughs> well, in my case, I could guess. <laughs> pretty much nothing. No one really cared. Still, risky business. <laughs> so anyway, I care about getting enough sleep and getting quality sleep, but I go through periods where it just won't happen. The immediate effects of this are compounded by my anxiety about long-term effects. Society seems to be getting better and better about emphasizing the importance of sleep, which is great, but that comes with the side effect of sad little insomniacs like myself regularly hearing or reading about how our brains have been and or are being irreparably damaged by sleep deficiency, which does not bring me peace. I realize that you are all that you are therap or you are two therapists and a life coach moonlighting as an audio guy, <laughs> and I therefore do not expect you to pull out a doctoral thesis on the effects of sleep deprivation on the brain. But hey, you know things. You know brains. Tell me what you can, please. After ten years of intermittent insomnia, so much, uh, uh, so much of that in my developmental years, am I broken? Ruined? permanently dysfunctional and possibly unworthy of engaging with human society as a whole for the rest of my life and all of eternity forever and ever. Amen. Note, if it sounds like I'm asking leading questions, it's because I'm asking leading questions. I would prefer not to be ruined and broken and whatnot. So if you can work that out for me, I'd super appreciate it. <laughs> In all seriousness, whatever you guys can give me, I will be grateful for it. Thank you guys for being such a valued part of my weekly routine. Anonymous. All right. That's a great letter. I'll just tell you, uh, having, just looked it up. Not a lot of famous people from Iowa. Oh, yeah. Nick being Iowa's favorite son. I can probably Plausible. name all of them. Uh, I, think I, can, I think he could make it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I have a fighting chance. Yeah. yeah you okay, it's there. John Wayne. Oh, he's, he's number one. Number one, number yeah. one with a bullet. Is that why John Wayne Airport is in uh, California? County? <laughs> yeah, that's why. Um, obviously, Ashton Kutcher. Oh, okay. He's from um, Iowa. Oh, he wasn't even on the list that I just Oh, he wasn't? Out. Nope. Bob Feller is probably on there. Yeah. Herbert Hoover. Herbert Hoover. Yeah, yep. Herb. Yeah. yeah. And then me, I think. I think you're I think up there. I'm, Yeah, the president. That's it. Yeah, and then you. Yeah. Name somebody else. I challenge you. I got nothing. I dare all no, of you. You're, you're right. That, we're yeah. done here. Yeah. yeah. There we go. I got nothing. Nobody comes from Iowa. So I'm at least the fifth favorite son. Yeah. Oh, well, Johnny Carson. Ooh. Okay, six. between him and me, it's pretty close. I mean, yeah. you're alive. I, yeah. <laughs> the famous <laughs> living son. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. We could just thin this list down. Yeah. That gets rid of Hoover. If it's living, yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's really just me and Ashton. Yeah, you I and think. Ashton Kutcher, I think, are <laughs> top two. Yeah. And for music lovers out there, Glenn Miller. Ah. Oh, Glenn Miller. Yeah. Yep. Yep. First yep. man in space. Hey. <sighs> <laughs> I even said for music lovers. <laughs> yeah. You don't think he loves music? Right there. You don't think the spa astronauts can't listen to music? Wow. Didn't say yeah. that. Wow. That's All right. Just prejudice. But yeah, you might be the fourth most, like, fourth or fifth <laughs> most famous person from Iowa. I think so. This podcast is pushing you up the ranks. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Ashton Kutcher. Yeah. So you got you got John Wayne, Herbert Hoover, uh, Johnny Carson, Ashton Kutcher, Glenn Miller. You might be number six. Nick Tangman. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I think I'm pushing past Glenn Miller, to be honest. Also, we're overdue that for... That AMA really... Yeah, that really that helped. That AMA yeah, pushed me past Glenn We got you way up there. Yeah, I think I you think. probably have a shot. We are overdue for a month of Iowa trivia. I think oh, that would have been a great one. Yeah. 
Just oh, all I Iowa. I thought about that. All oh, Iowa. You, okay. could, you could have yourself a day. Oh, that's going to be the next take... six months. Easy. <laughs> Oh, you could, or you could do, uh, you could alternate. You could do Iowa, uh, Leva- Nevada. Oh, Louisiana. that'd be fun. I yeah, could. yeah, yeah. Just go through all of them. So oh, to the writer, good. as yeah. Nick is writing down furiously all of his, <laughs> he's already started. He's I have Googling another. It right now. Well, I've got a, I've got a list. <laughs> and I've I got keep a list of Iowa facts. Parts of the brain. I'm not doing that. No, 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 no. Forget, no, no, that. forget that. that. Iowa facts. No, the Iowa facts. The wrinkly parts. So <laughs> to this uh, anxious and hilarious writer, uh, a couple of things. The first thing is don't. Okay, so your anxiety is being triggered by this fear that irreparable harm is being done. I want you to first know this. The sleep industry is huge. I mean, between the mattress sales and the medicines and and the white noise and the special things and the apps and all this crap. There is a lot of money in this. Yeah. yeah. And and so you have to understand that, that the fear tactic of, like, telling people it's so important, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Okay. So they're, they're, they're using every little piece of neuroscience that's ever come out talking about how sleep is good for the brain. It's and not unimportant. It's important. You know, but they're, they're amplifying it to this fever pitch. Like, there's, oh, my God. Like, same thing. as Like, if you eat a cheeseburger, you get a heart attack. Like, yes, if you ate all the cheeseburgers, you know, or like, yeah, if it was a routine forever. But, like, come on. Like, having one is not causing irreparable harm. The same thing is true with insomnia. Like, your body is going to get the sleep that it needs if you're having trouble, you know, calming your brain down. This fear you have of, like, irreparable damage Listen, I'm not sitting here as a neuroscientist staring at brain scans and telling you that you're fine, but I'm telling you, I do not think that that's at the fever pitch level of, like, I'm in physical danger. There's been physical harm. TBIs, traumatic brain injuries, cause physical harm. Substances cause physical harm. Yeah, CTE. Yeah, CTE. Like, no. Lack of sleep, I think it's it, it matters in a sense because I know that, like, your cells do some of the maintenance that happens during the sleep pattern glial cells get you know coated in new myelin things like that um your oh, neurotransmitters you know the come on <laughs> just throwing out words the, you know your, your drachmas get more lira <laughs> i mean you know the, these very important neuro a lot of commoners don't understand what i'm talking about right you, yeah, you thanks to, thanks for dumbing it down for yeah, us common you know folk. this is when the hibachis you know are, are getting uh, all of the walk and so you know this is important that's happening but i don't think you have irreparable harm that's exactly the, and as a non-neuroscientist, go on. <laughs> the issue that I would take would be irreparable. I don't think they're the brain, irreparable, perhaps. You're right, right. There you That's go. what I say. What I say? You said like rep, rep to you, you threw it. You threw a, a, was too a, many T's ir, into that word. Reptilian. That's yeah, a, that was it. Yeah. Uh, I don't even know what you said. The, it was uh, irredeemably bad. Go on. <laughs> it's pronounced chimera. But chim- there you go. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the brain actually heals pretty well. Yeah. Yes. It, it, that's something we don't really think about because, I mean, obviously brain damage is very scary. It's, sure. It's terrible. But, I mean, even with, uh, you know, doctors who work with CTE, you know, yes. they've, they've been able to demonstrate uh, progress. Right. In a lot of those areas uh, with improving brain functioning. So it's a lot, it, it heals a lot faster than yes. what we previously thought. Right. So, I wouldn't be too concerned about that. Plus, being overly concerned about that just means that you're going to have less sleep. Right. Right? Because you're just creating more anxiety right. about having anxiety about yes. not being able to sleep. Right. Um, Getting yourself all stirred up in and that I, cycle. I can actually relate to a lot of this, too. You know, I, I love the fact that you're talking about healthy, you know, exercise, all of that. It is incredibly useful for your mental health. It's it's very helpful in dealing with depression. It also is very helpful in... Um, in healing your brain, mm-hmm. you know, physical exercise actually has an effect on brain development and healing. Mm-hmm. So that's very important that you're doing that. I actually went through kind of a, a, about like a year of insomnia mm-hmm. through a phase a while back. And I couldn't figure out what it was, but it was like restless leg syndrome mm. where at night, like my legs just had to constantly move mm-hmm. and it was torture because mm-hmm. I was incredibly tired but I couldn't sleep. I was up every like 45 minutes. I had to like, I would get up and I would just walk up and down the stairs. Oh, wow. Just to try, try to tire my legs. Really? So I can go back to sleep. Oh, wow. It was miserable. Um, turns out it was the supplements I was taking. Oh, yeah. It was a, the pre-workout and post-workout oh, stuff yeah. that I was on. Yeah. And kind of started 
cutting back on those. You shouldn't take those before bed. And, uh, well, I wasn't taking them before bed, uh-huh. but I was working out in the evenings. Uh-huh. And so I was taking, you know, the, the pre-workout at like right. 5.30. Oh, yeah. Post-workout was at 7. Yeah. And my, I just wasn't winding down. Yeah. My brain was winding down, but my body was just like, let's go, let's go, let's go. Right. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, actually the whole pandemic and not being able to go to the gym for 14 months. Yeah. Like my sleep cycle went right back into like very restful night mm. sleeps. Mm-hmm. Um, now I'm working out in the morning. Yeah. So, so it's, you don't have that problem. It's, yeah. Less of an issue. But may, take a look at that. That could be something that's going on too. If you know yeah. what, what your diet is and your any kind of supplementation. But I don't want your health anxiety to trigger too much with this. And And one of the things I think you should know is. When it comes to brain damage, okay, and that's that's almost what these commercials and stuff are trying to claim, you need to understand how resilient the brain is. We have worked in rehabs where we have met people who have used all the drugs, all of the drugs, and they were using oh, they them. Should be they should be therapists. That's <laughs> one of the qualifications, actually, is we yeah. all have to do that. That's what we do in the academy. <laughs> <laughs> we also have to get tased. But we've met people who have used all of the drugs and we're using them as teenagers during those formative years. And you would be surprised how humans can put their bodies and their brains through a tremendous amount of actual abuse. And their brains, even if they really have been actually impaired in some ways, human brains are so resilient. They, they, they forge new paths, neuroplasticity. You know, they, they go through changes and they're, they have this ability to heal and to regen. And so you need to understand that, you know, this fear of like, you know, somehow your body's keeping score and like, you know, you've missed a certain number of hours of sleep in your life. And like now your brain is somehow missing that time of, of somehow developing or like, that's not how this works. Like your body and brain are always doing its own reboot, its own cleansing process. Our species is a very resilient species. You are the descendant of ancestors who were up all night, you know, waiting for bears, you know, and like lions. Like, we have the ability to be very resilient. In the military, they have to go through in depth training to deprive themselves of sleep and still perform at peak physical uh, levels and and mental levels to to know what to do in, in crisis situations. Our species is able to do that. So you need to understand that you are built very resilient. And you, that what, what Nick said, that the part about it being irreparable. Uh, reptilian. <laughs> I said reptilian. That word. Uh, it's yeah. not. So we don't want you to think that, Ryder, because you are resilient and you're going right. to be okay. Also, don't interpret any of what Jim said as just uh, devil may care, do whatever yeah. you want. No, no, no. Your brain. We're no. definitely not saying that. Don't either. use all the drugs. That's yeah. a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> Most. <laughs> Unless you're going to become a therapist. Then, then you got to do what you got to do. We are going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we are answering a question about when your partner has a lack of sexual interest. You're listening to Pod Therapy. Today's episode is brought to you by Smitty Scoop, Jake Schneider, Carolyn Albert, Kevin Chamberlain. Would you like to sponsor the show? Become a therapy producer at patreon.com slash therapy. Our next trivia question from Trivial Pursuit 20th Anniversary Edition is... What much-traveled sportscaster once earned a $25,000 signing bonus to regrow his mustache? Oh, wow. Was it A, Howard Cosell, B, Stuart Scott, C, Greg Gumbel, or D, Keith Oberman? Oh, wow. If you'd like to join the therapy producers and make the show possible, you can go to patreon.com slash therapy and sign up. Again, that's patreon.com slash therapy. Huh. See, I'm trying to imagine... Uh, the only two names in that list that I even recognize are Gumble and Keith Oberman. Okay. And I'm trying to think of either of those guys, if I've ever even seen them, with a mustache, and I'm struggling. Like, Keith, no. I don't think it's Keith. I don't think that Keith Oberman ever had a mustache. Gumble, maybe. But now I'm thinking, does he have one now? And I, I'm, like, completely forgetting that? I don't even know. <laughs> Again, this oh my God, it's terrible that things <laughs> always remind me of The Office. But this reminds me of the one where they were... When Stanley was away. Uh Uh-huh. And then the office was torn. Does Stanley have a mustache? And then there's like half the people like, of course he does. And the other half like, no, he doesn't. And then so they had this huge long, (laughs) they had a bet going. But whether whether he really did. he actually has a mustache. Because none of them could remember. That's funny. That's exactly how I feel. All right. I'm going with Gumble. Okay. Uh, Cosell. Okay. Final answers. I'm I'm going with Cosell because of the age. Okay. At twenty five grand seems a little low for uh, modern day stuff with Gumble. 
Right. Okay. 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 There you are. All right. What's the you answer? are both wrong. It was okay. Keith Oberman. What? Yeah. Really? I had the same yeah. thought that I had. You know, I was thinking that just seems too too new. Too new. Yeah. Wow. All right. yeah. Keith Oberman. Didn't even know he had a mustache. Yep. Wow. Young Keith Oberman. I think all of the, No, Howard Cosell is the only one I'm not sure about. But Stuart Scott, I believe, had a mustache. Greg Gumbel, I think, at one point had a mustache. Yeah, I don't I don't know that Cosell ever had a mustache. I don't think he did. I was I just going he was clean shaven. Yeah. yeah. I don't even know who you're talking about. I Howard remember. Cosell back in like the 70s, 80s. Okay. Yeah. Uh, he no. did a lot of football. Oh, he did everything. Howard Cosell did everything. Yeah, yeah. All the drugs. Yeah. He did all the He's drugs. A therapist. Yeah. <laughs> That's how you become great. Yep. All right. New listener and loving the podcast so far. My monogamous. Give it time. Give it time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for stopping by. We're sorry to lose you. <laughs> My monogamous partner of eight years says that he is too stressed from working full time and going to school on top of it, that sex just is not a priority for him. He has even said, since it's important to me, I am free to go out and fulfill those needs myself. He understands, and it doesn't even really bother him. I've told him that my preference is him, and I appreciate the offer, but I am the jealous type, and if he wants to step out as well, at least let me know ahead of time, which he agreed to, but said he had no plans to do so because he doesn't even want sex. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't be interested in that. Yeah. That's what it sounds like. However, <laughs> due to some snooping, don't judge me, he does have a very active interest in sex as he looks at porn on a daily basis. Do you think he is interested in sex, just not with me? And perhaps this is a sneaky way to open the relationship without cheating? Or could he really just enjoy taking things into his own hands, pun intended, and doesn't really want sex like with it. me or anyone <laughs> else, period? P.S. If it helps, he does talk about our future together often. Thanks, James. Okay. Um, so my thought immediately kind of goes to with the... The pornography. So this is something that we've talked about a lot on the show. Yeah. Is with a lot of people, um, you know, kind of, I don't want to say, I don't want to use addiction quite to the point yet. No, no. no. But like Compulsive chronic, use. chronic use yeah. of pornography, yeah. it does decrease sexual activity within the relationship. It usually does. Yeah. yeah. Because it's, it's easy. It's accessible. It's right there. Yeah. It's just fast. You get to it right away. You get that dopamine rush faster than what you would get to it in sexual intercourse within the relationship. Right. So that's immediately where my mind went to. And I, I wouldn't rush to think it's about you Mm -hmm. or that he's no longer sexually attracted to you. Right. Um, it could just be part of the porn use. Yeah, I think that it's a, it's a fair hypothesis, right? right. Cuz there is sort of this like burnout, like a neuron burnout here on mm-hmm. on like putting so much sex visuals in front of a person that they start to kind of just more so lean that way and they lose interest in physical sex because the brain is just not seeing that as sex like the Well, yeah, way. I mean it's yeah. like if if uh you know me accomplishing something like uh, going to the gym and having a good workout, I get a little rush of dopamine. Right. If I could do that or push a button and get the dopamine, yeah. I'll push the button. Yeah, it's going to happen. Right. Yeah. It's kind of the same way with pornography versus you know, yeah. sex in a relationship. Now, to the question of like, is this some sneaky, you know, side back around move here where they're trying to open the relationship? That was their, their gimmick the whole time. And by saying that they were not feeling very sexual with me, they were forcing the issue by making me open it up. I don't know. I mean, I generally take people at their word. I don't like to assume nefarious plotting. It's certainly I, difficult for us to do so. Yeah. <laughs> right? with, with the information presented in an email. Right. Yeah, right. Like, how can we, you know, get to that assumption? So I always want to presume innocence, writer. I don't think that's what your partner's doing. Um, but, you know, I think if they're authentically trying to tell you, like, I am stressed – Sex is stressful right now for me. I I don't have that appetite. And I guess I don't want to say that they're lying because, you know, you point out like, well, they they watch porn. You know, they seem interested in sex. Being interested in sexuality is not the same as having the appetite or desire to make love or to like actually perform the action. They're not identical. You know, you might watch Food Network and not eat a lot of food. Like, you know, you can see it as an entertainment or form as well. enjoy watching Food Network, but I hate to cook. I hate to cook. That, there you go. That's yeah. the better example. Yeah, yeah, that. And so that could be, you know, similar here where, like, sex feels stressful. It feels like it's it's not, you know, something that they're looking forward to for whatever reason. And, and so, and I get it, though. You know, James, I think that you feel 
it's hard not to take that personally. It's hard to, you know, hear that and, and not think that there's something wrong with you. But I think your partner's trying to tell you that that's not the case. And, um, you know, and I get that it's different. You know, whenever you have a mismatch of, of sexual compatibility, it can be, um, it can be hard to sort of find your way through that. I like, by the way, that you are being very slow to embrace the open relationship thing. I think a lot of people reach for that as a solution to fixing a problem mm-hmm. and, and like whatever it is like, oh, we're, we're having a hard time right now. And I had one therapist tell me uh, open relationships are the new let's have a baby to like, <laughs> save the relationship. <laughs> like, it'll be better if we have a baby. Like, it's the new let's throw an open relationship. I've never thought about that before. The, the open relationships that I know of that have succeeded. Yeah, definitely went from a, you know, just a place of like. Hey, we're doing great. Yeah. This is this is all fantastic. This is a, a great relationship. And uh also we do this why now. don't we also try this? Right. That's mm-hmm. when I see them be successful. Yeah, that's true. I've never yeah. thought about that. I think that mm-hmm. they're more successful as something that naturally comes out of a good relationship mm-hmm. than as a cure for any particular problem. I, I usually and no, it doesn't mean you can't, but I, I, I guess right. I'm saying I like your hesitance. I like that you're thinking about it carefully. And not just immediately going for that because it can complicate the bond. So it's something you want to be really slow in adopting if that's something you're thinking about. Yeah, I'd agree because it's just it's another factor in the relationship now that you have to manage. And if you're already struggling managing all the other factors, adding one more component is not going to be helpful or beneficial in the long run. Absolutely. So, you know, to you, Ryder, I think when it comes to how to rehab sexual desire in relationships – I think that your your partner is telling you, I don't anticipate this being a permanent thing. I think your partner is saying, my work life and school life and brain cells are overextended. I just don't have the bandwidth to get interested in this right now, and, and I'm trying to communicate that to you. So I don't want you to feel hopeless like this never gets better. It sounds like your partner is currently just overextended, and you're dealing with a season of life. And, Ryder, that's very common, very common in relationships, that humans are just going through their own stories and doing their own things, their sexual appetites, or even their ability and bandwidth to be you know intimate or relational or emotionally connected can sometimes be strained and limited. And that's not bad, and, and that doesn't mean that they're being deceptive, and that doesn't mean that they don't care for you. Um, it, it sometimes just means that they are overspent, and that, mm-hmm. that's a real thing. That is real. And so I would just encourage you to stay hopeful, stay trusting that it gets better. Um, be reluctant for some of these more exotic solutions, um, and, and you know maybe even take this to couples therapy at some point. That might be something where you know, you're not going to do this, this huge lifelong event of, of therapy, but you know if you don't feel like you and your partner are able to discuss it in a healthy way where needs are being discussed and met – um, that might be a couples therapy thing because it, sex is this tricky thing where I do consider it a human need. And, and I do think that in a relationship, we want to hear if our partner's telling us, I need more from you. And your partner says, I want to outsource that. I don't want to give you that need. I want you to go get that somewhere else. That steer toward couples therapy. I think, I think that there needs to be a, a therapist involved in that conversation to talk about our needs in the relationship to talk about how we feel those needs need to be met. Um, because that's how I'd feel about anything. Well, and it sounds like the, sounds like James isn't really on board with that right now anyway. Right. And so the last thing you really want to do is do something that you feel forced into doing. Exactly. And if you're, if you yeah. get resentful, if your needs aren't right. being met and you're, you're being told like, I don't want to have sex with you, figure it out yourself. You can get resentful and feel like you're, I mean, and that's a good question. At some point you're like, is this relationship meeting needs? And, and do you have a responsibility in some ways to sort of have sex with me and like, you know, help me meet my needs? Like there's a conversation to be had, I think, mm-hmm. about what expectations each person has in the relationship and what we each feel is important to keep this being a relationship. So James, consider, you know, maybe checking in with a therapist. Um, that might be something that you guys might want to sit down and work on, mm-hmm. even if it's just to hear each other and get to a healthy place or to navigate this conversation about an open relationship. I'd love for you guys to do that with support. I think that that would be a more successful strategy. Yep. Great letter. Great question. And I hope it works out for you and uh, rooting for you, friend. So here at the end of the show, uh, we have a little bit of spare time and we have uh, a another response letter in the Patreon portion. Uh, we read two letters that we've received that are not questions, but more reactions, reflections. Um, we have another one here. This one's a little bit long, but it's a good one. And uh, I think it responds to a really important uh, segment that we did, a very important um, uh, series. We actually have a, another one that is responsible about wasting therapy. But this one is reflecting on the surviving suicide episode with Rob. And it comes from Keith. 
Hey guys, I've just finished listening to episode 173, Surviving Suicide with Robert Shields, and it gave me chills. The similarities between Rob's story and my suicide attempt are hard to hear. About four years ago, I went through a major life change. I had been working as a mover, and after months of trying to figure out why my back hurt, I was finally in an emergency situation that required surgery. Unfortunately, they had discovered the cause of my back pain too late, and the majority of the nerve damage was irreversible. My recovery took about six months. That was six months of being nearly entirely bedbound, having to have a catheter, and home physical therapy. To this day, I still have diminished sensation in my legs and feet, nearly constant back pain, and diminished sexual ability. It just wreaked havoc on my body and my life in general. On top of these physiological changes, I also experienced life changes. I moved from working in the field as a mover to working behind a desk in the office of the same moving company. This position turned out to be very overwhelming for me. The new position had too many responsibilities that were very different from my previous work experience. Being my Between my home life and work, I was overwhelmed to say the least. I live with my significant other and her three children uh, and were always struggling financially. And all of these changes were not making things any easier. I've battled with opioid addiction for many years. I'm in recovery now, but at the time, I was not. I started borrowing, read, stole, with the intention of replacing before anybody noticed, money from my employer to support my drug use. Of course, since I'm writing this, you know that I was eventually caught. My employer was understanding, but left with nothing to do but fire me. I was so afraid to tell my significant other that I had lost my job. I was ashamed of myself. So for three days, I would leave the house in the morning as though nothing had changed. Then I would go and park the car somewhere and spend the day drinking and then drive home in the evening as though I had worked all day. I had started to form a plan in my head by this point. I've always struggled with undiagnosed depression. At least that is my impression. And my life had rarely been easy. Both of my parents are deceased. I don't have family nearby to lean on and I don't have much of a life beyond my home life. The reason I mention those things is because after I lost my job, I felt hopeless. I started dreading having to tell my fiancé that I had lost my job and, and that I had failed our family. The idea that they would all just be better off without me started creeping into my mind, just like it did for Robert. I had had a suicide method planned for years. Just like Rob, I can still remember the feeling of how surreal it was to walk through the store filled with people just living their lives while I'm gathering the materials to plan to kill myself. I was walking through the store drunk and stealing things I needed. I didn't have any money at that point. Then I drove my van to a familiar place that I knew had no cell reception, sat for a bit. I finally worked up the courage, and I proceeded with the plan. I'm not going to describe the plan. He did in the letter, but I won't. Um, I sat and listened to NPR for a bit more. I don't remember the thoughts going through my head. I remember the decision being made that it was time to do this. I woke up later uh, staring into a bright light and 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 a face and voice that I didn't recognize shouting my name. It was the police. My fiancé had begun looking for me after I should have been home from work. She had no idea where I would have gone. Luckily for me, a friend knew me very well, and he had a good idea of the place I might be. He was able to direct the police to my location. Apparently, since I had so much to drink, I fell asleep before I could complete the suicide action. That's what saved me in a way. My alcohol consumption had caused me to pass out before I could do the thing that I was planning to do. I was even more ashamed of myself at that point. If I thought I would be bad, if I thought it would be bad to face my fiance after I lost my job, it was going to be much worse after I had done this. Of course, I was met with nothing but love and understanding from everybody. I left the hospital that day. I was just back to my old self. Granted, I needed to seek psychological care and had needed so for a long time. The main hurdle between me and my medical care has always been insurance. It's also been the thing holding me back from formal addictions treatment. I've been self-administering Suboxone for two and a half years now. As a matter of fact, at the beginning of my work shift tonight, I work third shift, my employer offered me a permanent position. I've worked here for a little over six months, but through the temp agency. Thus, I have not been eligible for insurance until today. There's so much more to this story. I just wanted to relate my story as far as it related to your latest episode. The empathy that I experienced as I listened to Robert's story gave me chills. I'm constantly working to maintain the progress I've made. Along with recovery treatment, my insurance is going to allow me to see a therapist. I felt for a long time that it would be great, greatly beneficial for me. 
I think that therapy is something everybody can benefit from, and also your podcast is something everybody can benefit from. You guys are fantastic, and I'm so glad that you guys hooked up with the ICS crew. Just last week, I heard the episode of ICS with your jock versus nerd. That was the first time I heard you guys mentioned on ICS in the backlog. You guys do so much good for so many people. I hope that continues for a long time. Thanks for reading my rant. Most sincerely, Keith. <laughs> awesome. Well, wow. That's- powerful story yeah very powerful story thank you for sharing that it's uh yeah I, i'm glad you're able to relate to uh robert's story and uh i'm glad you survived yeah grateful everything turned out as it did and that you're getting the help that you need now keith you know yeah. to hear that story and to find out that now that you have the insurance you're getting you got into recovery support you're getting the addiction stuff dealt with uh that you're getting into therapy It's tremendous. And, you know, that was one of the reasons why we wanted Robert to share that story. It's something we've been conspiring with him for a long time to do. Um, It's something we tried to approach as humanly as we could, you know, to be casual about it, but also to be sincere about it. And I I know so many people have been affected listening to that episode. It was Mm -hmm. a profound story. And to hear that that sincere tone and to understand that you can survive this, that you cannot, you should not believe these delusions, that it's always okay to go get help, really meaningful stuff. Mm-hmm. And so, Keith, I'm glad that it affected you, man. And if there's anybody out there that's having these dark thoughts, that's feeling depressed, that's telling themselves that they'd be better off dead, that their family doesn't want them around, those are lies. They are not true. You've got to come back to the truth. You are a human being who is worthy of love. You have a good life ahead of you. Better days are ahead of you. It's always going to get better. Change will happen no matter how dark, no matter how stuck it feels right now. That is a lie. That is temporary. It will get better. And remember, you can call 911 and tell them what's going on. They will get you to help. And remember that you can always look up a therapist in your area. And and like Keith said, therapy's for everybody. Okay, Mm -hmm. You don't have to meet a certain criteria. You don't have to wonder if you're supposed to be there. Just go. Just go. There's always a way forward. Keith, thanks for sharing that, man. It's a nice yeah. story. Thank you. All right. We are at the end of the show, and uh, so it's time to thank all those who make our show possible. Please remember that we do tape these in advance, and so if you have become a patron since May 16th, uh, we are not announcing it on this episode, but we will always announce it at some point in the future whenever we get to that. And remember, you can always go to our Twitter, at uh, Pod Therapy Guys, and we will always acknowledge you the day of. As soon as you uh, pledge at patreon.com slash therapy, we will immediately acknowledge you on our Twitter, always, 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 and we'll always try to get to it on the show as well we never forget except that time we forgot yeah Yeah. sorry ezekiel we love you man (laughs) (laughs) but we want to thank our therapist that you know of (laughs) (laughs) oh yeah it's the only one that we've ever caught (laughs) yeah Yeah. i'm sure we've forgotten everybody we forgot to talk about our therapy producers in the last episode we did (laughs) which in fairness is because you guys cut off my mic I think that was part of it. Whose fault was, was, whose fault was the mic getting cut off? This is true. I it brought these deserved. consequences on myself. So we want to thank our bosses, the Saccharin 16, the mysterious and shrouded Illuminati members of the fan club, the Thera Producers. Thank you, Smitty Scoop, Jake Schneider, Robert Brownie Jr. Mint, Kayla Lansbury, Elio Dare, Judy Schneider, Nathan's Hot Dog Scoop, Scoop King of Student Debt, Dr. Ben Don, <laughs> Crazy Banana Scoop, Mason Miller, Scott Jameson, Carolyn Albert, Leon Kassab, Kevin Chamberlain, Malaya, Richard Macy and Ezekiel Lawrence. And if you'd like to hear this episode uncut and unedited, and why wouldn't you? And enjoy our spontaneous <laughs> side projects. Go to patreon.com slash therapy and thank you for supporting mental health. That's all the time we got for this week's session. We want to thank our landlords, Matt and Mattingly's Ice Cream Social Podcast, and thanks to those of you who contributed to our show today. We really appreciate it. Remember, pod therapy isn't something you should keep all to yourself. Share this episode with someone who needs it by opening the episode's description in your podcast app and copying and pasting the link we provide it into your social media. Don't forget, you can find us at facebook.com slash podtherapy, on Twitter at podtherapyguys, on Instagram at podtherapyguys, and at patreon.com slash therapy. Do you want to submit a question to the show? Ask anonymously at podtherapy.net or email us at podtherapyguys at gmail.com. I'm Nick Tangerman. I'm Keith Oberman's mustache. Thanks, and we'll see you for your appointment next week. That guy has a very, like, professorial voice. Yes. Keith Oberman. It's, like, very authoritative. And very political. And he did have a good mustache. I didn't know that he was a sportscaster. I had only discovered him in politics. Oh, oh no, I knew...